Peter Baker, chief White House correspondent for the New York Times and an MSNBC political analyst, is formerly the Moscow bureau chief for the Washington Post. Also with us, Eli Stogel, White House correspondent for the Wall Street Journal and MSNBC political contributor. And Paul Butler, law professor at Georgetown University, a former federal prosecutor and an MSNBC contributor. And Peter, I, I want to go to you first. You've been in these interviews, these rambling, incoherent interviews that New York Times has conducted, uh, similar to the Wall Street Journal's, uh, with the president. What is it like in that room? when he begins a sentence, cuts himself off, changes the subject, adds a new subject that isn't clear at all, uh, wanders off, and then maybe never answers where the whole question began? Well, he he he, um, he does uh, he does free float in these interviews. He does tend to sort of wander from subject to subject a little bit. It's very much stream of consciousness. It's um, it's very different than other presidents. No question about it. Other presidents tend to stick to talking points, tend to stick to previously scripted answers that they've given again and again and again. And the struggle for an interviewer is to try to get him off that kind of game. With President Trump, it's the other way around. Uh, he'll tend to sort of go where his mind takes him and where his uh, you know where he's thinking about and what you want to do as an interview is try to sort of really kind of force him to focus on one topic for a little bit and try to uh, get a precise answer get a, a sustained answer but the trick is often the, uh, these other thoughts he expresses the the new directions he goes with these answers are pretty interesting in their own right and you kind of want to explore them too so it's a it's a much more interesting and engaging kind of interview than uh, than some of the ones we have uh, and Peter your reaction to uh, the White House uh, position today uh, which is that uh, you know, the president just weighed in, whatever that means, on Donald Trump Jr.'s uh, first statement in response to your newspaper's uh, investigation uh, of that meeting. And then Donald Trump Jr. had to issue two more statements each day. The New York Times advanced the story. Yeah, there's no question that the first statement was not a complete description of this event. It said that the meeting was primarily about adoption policy. And what it did not say is that it had been advertised as an opportunity to get incriminating information about Hillary Clinton provided by the Russian government. That's a very different understanding of that meeting. So the first statement was certainly not complete, certainly misleading. We reported very shortly afterwards that the president himself had signed off on this statement. And then Jay Sekulow, who's one of his lawyers, went on television, went on this network and other networks to say, no, that's not true, that that's an incorrect statement. The president had no involvement in it. That obviously is not true, according to the White House itself. Today, the White House itself today said he was involved. Whether you use the words "weigh in" or "dictator" or whatever else, the White House, in effect, confirmed uh, what was reported way back in July that he was involved in this statement, contrary to his own lawyer. And uh, Paul Butler, the Washington Post has multiple sources uh, uh, for its story about the president dictating every word of the statement. And so uh, when investigators see something like that, do they then try to find those sources who are unnamed in the Washington Post and try to get their accounts of this? Well, Lawrence, they don't just try to find them. They subpoena them. To but how, come how do to they the do region. that when they're unnamed sources in the Washington Post? So they have, uh, Mueller has a team of some of the country's best investigators and prosecutors. It, it, with all due respect to the Washington Post, if the Post can find these guys, uh, certainly investigators with subpoena power can find them, and they will want to because now, if the Post is correct, we have direct evidence that Trump not only participated in a cover-up, he did so trying to throw off the investigators. We have evidence of a corrupt intent to impede an investigation. Lawrence, that's obstruction of justice. Eli, there's another uh, behavioral indicator in this story, and that is uh, this is the way the Trumps tell stories. Uh, the, the, the president uh, saying, you know, uh, taking a few different positions on weighed in or had nothing to do with it. Uh, but when you're under oath and testifying under oath, uh, you can get tr tripped up by perjury wires on things that don't seem particularly central uh, to what the investigation is about. It is not, Donald Trump Jr.'s first statement to the New York Times is not central to this investigation. But if someone does not tell the truth, Truth under oath in questioning about that, someone can end up with a perjury charge on this peripheral matter. 
Right, and this so far has just been a constant story about hubris, uh, arrogance. Uh, you can kind of understand uh, why maybe they were overconfident uh, inside Trump Tower during the transition and continue to be inside the White House. They won the election. Donald Trump's uh, penchant for uh, contradicting himself almost constantly, for adhering to the lifelong policy as described in the Art of the Deal of truthful hyperbole, all these things were visible to the whole country, and he won anyway. And so you can kind of understand uh, where some of this hubris comes from after November 8th, but the reality is they continue to sort of, as Lindsey Graham said, they want to get out of one box and they put themselves in an even tighter box because they're so eager, they're so short-sighted in sort of trying to win every point, not letting anything go, not thinking they need to consult uh, with their lawyers, just sort of immediately rashly reacting on Twitter. That is a tendency that continues to exacerbate uh, the, the legal trouble, uh, it seems, for this president uh, and perhaps for some campaign folks as well. And Peter Baker, are working for one of the two newspapers, uh, you, you with the New York Times and the Washington Post, that, that keep delivering these blockbuster uh, revelations about the Trump White House almost entirely from unnamed sources within the Trump White House or the Trump world. I, I'd just like to get a, a general sense from you of, of what, what your guess is about the special prosecutor's ability to find those sources that have been speaking uh, without, without their names uh, in the Washington Post, in the New York Times. And I'm not talking about you going anywhere near those sources, but just the, the, the extent to which you sense they are available to talk and yeah. willing and or eager to talk. Well, well, that's a good question. Look, you know, as 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 was just said, there are you know prosecutors with the subpoena power have an awful lot of uh, uh, levers to work to get the people to testify. And what they tend to do is they tend to work from the outside in. They tend to get people who uh, are uh, you know provide information about other people who then uh, are brought under oath and then challenged with the information they've already been gotten and so forth. I don't think it's that hard for prosecutors to find people to testify about things like this. I think the harder thing for these prosecutors is to figure out, you know, what was going on with the Russians. Remember, this isn't a typical political scandal. This isn't a particular, you know, thing that we've seen in the past. This involves intelligence, uh, you know, another culture, another language, another uh, inst another government, what their intent was, what their modus was. And uh, I think that's where it's a more complicated thing than, than putting people who, who are Americans and who have been involved in campaign under it. That's a pretty basic thing that they do, uh, you know, quite often. Uh, which brings us to a Reuters report tonight of a new attorney joining Robert Mueller's team, uh, Greg Andres. He was the deputy assistant attorney general in the criminal division where he oversaw the fraud unit and managed the program that targeted illegal foreign bribery. Uh, Paul Butler, your reaction to that addition to the team? You know, it really doesn't matter who the president's lawyer is if he doesn't listen to them. So we had his current lawyer, Jay Sekulow, going on MSNBC and other news sources saying that the president had nothing to do uh, with Don Jr.'s uh, memo or his recollections of the meeting. We now know that that was false, which means either that President Trump was lying to his lawyer or his lawyer was lying to the American people. Uh, which would be a violation of the code of ethics, among other things. Uh, Eli Stokels, as Robert Mueller continues to staff up, uh, he's being defended by both parties uh, in the Congress, Democrats and Republicans, uh, some saying that if the president makes a move on the Justice Department, uh, that could be uh, the turning point that could point to a, a shorter term than four years for this presidency. Yeah, Lindsey Graham said last week, uh, in, you know, explicitly that if the president decides to go after Mueller, that could be the beginning of the end of his presidency. And you've seen really over the past week more Republicans uh, taking more strident positions, criticizing uh, this president more directly. Uh, it's not just Lindsey Graham and Ben Sass anymore. There are other people coming out, uh, Jeff Flake being one of them. But there are a number of people really sort of standing up and saying, 
this bothers me too, uh, and sort of breaking uh, six months of silence. And I think, you know, going back to the uh, Mueller hiring uh, a white collar crime attorney to add to the legal team, it's obviously a sign that this investigation is only just getting started. We'll probably go into 2018 and maybe past 2018. But that is going to drive President Trump up the wall. What did he say about a week or two ago? You can focus on Russia, but that's it. When he hears there is somebody uh, who's an expert in white collar crimes who's been added to this legal team, uh, I mean, I would just say I'm going to set my alarm uh, for about pretty early tomorrow morning uh, and check Twitter for what the president has to say because this is something uh, that seems like almost inevitably uh, is going to set him off. Well, that's going to be a big test for the new White House chief of staff if tw something happens on Twitter tomorrow morning. Morning. Eli Stokels, Peter Baker, and Professor Paul Butler, thank you all for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.